Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fourth session of your legislative training, how to testify and how to write letters to the editor. Um, I am your webinar host, Sarah Lochner, Executive Director of the Coalition of Local Health Officials. I use she, her pronouns. And with me today is Lizzie Atwood-Wills. Lizzie, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi hey everyone, Lizzie Atwood-Wills here. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I work with Stewart Collective on the CLO communications front for the next several months. Excellent, thank you so much, Stacy. And I'm assuming you all can see my screen now. Excellent, Jackson says yes, wonderful. Well, we, um, I do want to just let you know, we are doing this over the lunch hour. So please feel free to put, you know, take your camera off and eat your lunch. Um, especially since we are recording, you don't want um, everyone watching you eat lunch for the next 40 years on this um, recorded <laughs> training. Um, so feel free to do that. And then also, um, as I mentioned, this is being recorded. So just keep that in mind. And then for those of you watching the recording, please press pause and print the testimony bingo card um, posted on the CLO website with this PowerPoint presentation and this recording. Um, that way, when the time comes, you are ready to play along. And with that, we will get started. So today um, we are gonna learn the three different types of providing testimony and the differences between them when you're delivering that type of testimony. Um, we're gonna talk about what to include in your testimony and best practices for delivering verbal testimony. Uh, then we're gonna watch some short examples of verbal testimony, um, namely video of myself testifying, you're welcome. Um, and then while we're watching those videos, you all are gonna be filling out your bingo cards as you um, keep an eye out for things that I've mentioned in what to do and what not to do. Um, we are going to learn the difference between an op-ed and a letter to the editor. And then we are going to talk about how to write a letter to the editor. And with that, let's get started. So as I mentioned, there are two general kinds of testimony. There is written testimony, and verbal testimony. However, thanks to COVID, now you can deliver verbal testimony both in person or virtually um, over video platforms. The Oregon legislature uses Microsoft Teams. Um, so just keep that in mind. And you may want to, if you don't already have that on your um, computer, you may want to download Microsoft Teams for free and do a test run before you sign up for testimony but we'll go into that a little bit more detail later. Um, but we will also talk about written testimony today, along with both in-person verbal testimony and virtual verbal testimony. For written testimony, which is quite a bit easier, frankly, um, you definitely wanna submit it to the legislature in a professional looking format. If you're doing it for work, put it on um, letterhead, um, either do a letter style or a memo style, um, or you can do a one pager, include graphics and that sort of thing. Um, you should include your name and your email address so that if somebody random um, is looking at your testimony and they really like what they're reading and they wanna have your input on something else they're working on or include you in further legislative conversations on this topic, they know how to get a hold of you. With written testimony, there is no limit on length. However, brevity is still a very good idea um, because your audience, your main audience here is still legislators and they most likely are not going to read a 20 or 40 page dissertation um, or research paper. It's a great idea to keep it, you know, really no more than five pages. I would even advocate for less. And then you can include hyperlinks, data and visuals as needed um, if you wanna refer people to your citations or to further information on the topic. Um, when you're 
supporting or opposing specific legislation. It's especially when you're opposing Sarah, I think something happened with your audio. We can't hear you. Okay. Uh, Lizzie, can you hear me? I can hear you now, yep. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks for that. Okay, where what did you hear last? Um, we heard we you were talking about the length of the testimony and uh, keeping it short. Excellent. So, um, so yeah, you want to keep it. I would say five pages or less. Always less is more. Um, but you can link to high, um, further resources. You can include citations. Um, and you can also include some data and a bar graph or two, or some sort of visual if you would like um, to really illustrate your point. Those things are really, really helpful to legislators, um, as well as citing whatever references um, you use in your testimony so that they can verify your research and learn more if they want to. Um, Whenever you're speaking, especially in opposition to either a bill or an amendment, it's really important that you cite the specific language that is a problem. So you wanna say section two, line 12, um, these three words, X, Y, Z, are problematic because I recommend you know, taking those out or inserting these three words instead. When you do that, that is very helpful to legislators um, to help them solve the problems within the bill because they don't want unintended, unintended consequences either. And so as a subject matter expert, your specific input like that is very helpful for the legislative process. Verbal testimony is pretty similar in terms of what you want to include, um, but it should be shorter in length. You can include a lot more in your written testimony than you will have the opportunity to speak aloud typically. Um, most committee chairs will only allow you about three to five minutes to deliver your verbal testimony because typically there are 20 other people signed up to testify on that same bill. And so they have to manage their committee time wisely in order to get through all the bills. And so consequently, you will need to um, speak very briefly, really be prepared and polished, know what your high level main points are that you want to make. You can include a couple of points of data, a little bit of research, um, and ideally a real life story or example. Legis legislators really love to have a repeatable story and as humans, we love storytelling and stories really stick with us. So if you can include a brief story about how this program has helped someone in your community, that's really powerful. Um, I would also say don't use acronyms without explaining them. Um, some people will get really hung up on that and it will um, make your entire testimony confusing to them if they don't know what you're talking about. Um, and then I'll say, um, some tips and tricks when you're doing your verbal testimony is that your verbal testimony does not have to match your written testimony in format. In fact, I really recommend having your nice polished written testimony submitted to OLIS and then taking that text and cutting it down, increasing the font, adding some colors and highlights so that you have visual cues in your built into your testimony so that your eyes can keep track of where they need to be and you can still look up at your audience. Um, if you're giving verbal virtual testimony, you can split your screen and have your testimony up on one side and scroll through it like a teleprompter uh, while still looking at your audience. If you're giving your testimony in person, I highly recommend doing the old school style of printing it out um, and taking the paper with you up to the dais to deliver your testimony. Um, 
taking a laptop up is very awkward because you're trying to pull out the chair, which can be kind of clunky. Um, and keeping your laptop awake or your iPad awake when a legislator asks you a question, sometimes it can go to sleep and then you're punching in your code and or your password and it just creates awkwardness and delays and will make you feel nervous. It makes me feel nervous. So I highly recommend just having your printed out large font testimony um, with you when you give your in-person testimony. Um, and then of course you wanna practice, practice, practice. Um, it's, you'll feel more comfortable, you'll be more confident in delivering your testimony and you wanna make sure that you can have a concise, polished five minute version. And then if you need to drop a couple of points, whittle that down to a three minute version. Um, oftentimes too, the chair of the committee will tell you, okay, your time is up. And you can say, okay, I'll just wrap up. And sometimes you can squeeze one extra minute out of them that way um, by just saying, okay, I'll wrap up. And then usually they'll, they'll let you say your last few sentences. So that's your chance to uh, make your last point and to really wrap up. Um, and with that, Lizzie, did I miss anything or do you have anything to add? Yeah, just quickly here, I'll add two points, which is that um, I suggest that you prepare for questions in case a legislator on the um, dais has questions for you. And, and to, on that note, prepare to answer the way that you want those answers to be received. So if it's a complicated answer um, or it's a question that you're... Um, concerned about answering, you can pivot. Um, you can also always claim that you don't have the answer and that you'll need to follow up, um, but do prepare for those ahead of time, just not to be caught off guard. Um, and second, I would say, um, if you're speaking to amendments on a bill, make sure to, to refer to that amendment specifically. So those will be listed in OLIS and they'll usually say dash A2 or dash A4, something along those lines. So if you're speaking to you know, a specific point in the bill, make sure to reference that too. Right, so you would say something along the lines, um, you know, I'm opposed to the dash 14 amendment specifically section three, line four, because of X, Y, Z. So yeah, it is, that is a great suggestion. Thanks, Lizzie. Okay, so moving on, Lizzie's gonna walk us through some best practices. Great. Okay, so um, a couple of the best practices for virtual and in-person testimony are similar. So I'll start there. Um, with virtual and in-person, you're, you're always gonna wanna have a professional appearance. Um, if you're virtual, you know, the top half matters more than the bottom half. Uh, make sure to comb your hair, sort of have, wear something that makes you feel confident. Um, if you're going to the Capitol itself to testify in person, again, make sure something, make sure that you're wearing something comfortable um, that's not too hot. It's a little breathable. You know, um, public speaking can always make us more nervous than we are ordinarily, raises our body temperature, that kind of thing. Consider those. Um, and as Sarah said, prepare your talking points, do that practice. Um, when you go in person, bring your printed copy, make sure to print it ahead of time while there is a printer in the Capitol. Don't, don't take yourself down that rabbit hole, just prepare before. Um, and as Sarah said, have your talking points on uh, the side of your screen if you're doing it virtually. So um, I'm gonna move into virtual, then we'll go back to in-person. Um, specifically with virtual, you wanna make sure that your technology is prepared for your virtual testimony. Um, in the ways that I think about that are, does my audio work? Is my camera functional? Does my background um, look suitable? Is it are there gonna be outside noises that are distracting? Are people gonna be behind me? Can I find a neutral place um, to sit? So think about those things, make sure that if you're using headphones, which are generally recommendable, that they're connected to your audio system on your computer. Um, 
And then next, you know, you're going to want to, you're, you're always going to want to follow the directions given by the committee or the chair. Um, often that means, you know, muting and turning off your camera when you're not speaking um, in the moment um, or when you're not being spoken to and to be respectful of the other folks that are testifying or speaking in the meeting. Um, and then to always practice decorum. So that means using specific language to uh, make sure that you're respectful of the other folks in the meeting and um, addressing the committee appropriately. Um, you'll also wanna listen to other people who are testifying and legislators who are speaking so that you can refer to those points if they match your testimony. So you can take little notes and um, be prepared to sound like you were listening and that's always helpful. Um, and then last but not least, always be calm and polite allow yourself to have a professional demeanor, um, continue to breathe while you're speaking, just the sort of normal, um, you know, respectful professional uh, etiquette expectations. So, so we'll I'll, go ahead. I'll jump in and say sometimes, depending on the issue, legislators, you know, they're always campaigning. So sometimes they like to act upset or fired up from behind the microphone. And it's not, don't take it personally. It's not about you. It's legislative theater. So always remain calm and polite. And, you know, if at, you know, worst case scenario, you say, thank you for that question. I'll have to get back to you <laughs> in and then move on. So um, just keep that in mind. Always just smile and nod. That's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the key. That's okay. right. Go for okay. it. So for, um, for in-person, the, the one other really important point that we want to communicate to you is that make sure you leave yourself plenty of extra time to show up to the Capitol, to get to your committee room. Um, we do not want to be frantic, Franny, Pierre, stressed out Sally, whoever she is. We don't want to show up to the committee room with papers flying and not knowing where to sit and feeling frazzled, right? So give yourself the time to run into traffic, use the bathroom, find a parking spot that might be really far away, allow yourself the time to walk into the building, maybe you'll get lost, all these things might happen, it's okay. Give yourself that extra time so that if they do, you, you are still prepared and you can still show up early, you will thank yourself for it. Um, and we are on legislator schedules, which means sometimes they run an hour late and sometimes they're moving along and ready to go five minutes early. Um, and it's incumbent on you to be there when they are ready for you. So um, the one other thing I would say is that in each of these cases, virtual and in person, the committee chair will call you up when it's time for you to testify. So um, they'll say, um, you know, if they have a list, you'll sign in ahead of time and they'll call you that way, um, or you'll be slated into a certain time or a certain um, panel with other folks. So just be mindful of that. You don't go up at any given time. It's uh, There's structure to what sometimes seems like chaos. <laughs> yes, that is true. And I would just add to, um, because the legislature uses Microsoft Teams, which can be clunky at times, um, just make sure your Microsoft Teams is working. And um, oftentimes the committee rooms do fill up. Um, the seats will fill up if it's a packed agenda. Um, and so that's another reason why it's great to show up early is the committee rooms usually are opened 10 or 15 minutes before the hearing begins. And so you wanna be there so that you can get a seat. Um, okay. So Lizzie alluded to this a little bit earlier, but there is a formal protocol um, at the Oregon legislature. It's a best practice to use this. If you don't use it, it's not that big of a deal. The chair is not going to admonish you for not using it, but it's just best practice. So, um, so these conversation bubbles demonstrate the two major instances that you would need the formal protocol when you're testifying. The first is introducing yourself. So you will start all of your testimony by introducing yourself and ideally doing it this way. Um, Chair Patterson and members of the committee, 
My name is Sarah Lochner. I'm here today on behalf of the Oregon Coalition of Local Health Officials, referred to as CLO or CLHO. So um, when introducing yourself or addressing the committee, you always address the chair first and then the other members of the committee, and that carries forward into the next example as well. So when you're asked a question, um, it might go something like this. Chair Patterson, Senator Manning, thank you so much for that question. It is confusing to have two different rules. Having one rule for restaurants and bars and another for businesses will create confusion and drive complaints up. So as I mentioned in that example as well, you address the chair first and then the member who asked the question. So all things go through the chair. Um, and as mentioned before, you can say, Chair Patterson, Senator Manning, thank you for that question. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I will have to get back to you after the hearing. And they will always say, thank you so much. That would be very welcome. So um, it's always okay to not have the answer to a question and to follow up afterwards, usually in writing via email. Lizzie, anything to add there? Okay. Just that just that stating your name for the record is the one thing that the chair will interrupt you about. So make sure that that is the first line on your testimony when you're speaking verbally. Uh, my name is Lizzie Atwood Wills. I represent the Coalition of Local Health Officials and then move into your space. So um, they need that for the public record and that's their sort of one thing that they always request. And I always put it in my in my testimony, just so I don't forget, because you you get up there and you're you're a little nervous, um, and you're worried about how much time you have or don't have. Sometimes you will forget, so just include it as the first sentence in your testimony always. Um, and with that, um, we're going to have Lizzie walk us through um, a couple of how-to guides on the Oregon Legislature website. And I am going to pull those up. Great. Okay, so two of these um, guides are on the legis legislative website and um, it's convenient because if things change, they will update them. Um, you know, with the recent um, hybrid and in-person sort of model that the legislature takes, this is a good thing to reference for when you, um, when you will be testifying remotely and to check in as their systems change, if their technology improves, whatever. So um, on this page, um, you'll just see step-by-step -step the um, ways that you log in to Microsoft Teams, their best practices for doing it a few minutes early, um, getting settled in with your audio and video, making sure that you always stay muted and turn your, your video off when you're not um, there to speak in that moment. Um, and you'll be able to read through uh, their, their recommendations here as well. So um, I'll go ahead and move on to the next page. And so you'll see that these are in this drop down section that Sarah's clicking on through the Get Involved tab. Um, very easy to access on the legislative website. Um, Submitting written, written testimony on a bill is also here, and um, you'll do this through the committee page um, where you'll reference the specific bill. There's a sort, there's a form essentially that you can fill out. It'll tell you the specific type of file that you need to use. Um, and I'll note that if you uh, submit your written testimony for a certain bill, but the bill gets taken off of the committee agenda for that day, it's your responsibility to go back and resubmit the bill when it has its next hearing um, or else it won't be captured in the record. So um, unfortunately, they're not keeping track of those things the way that uh, you know maybe would be ideal, but it's okay as long as we know, we just need to go back and um, be sure to do that if, if the schedule changes. Um, one other thing about testifying remotely that I want to stress is that um, there is an option to testify by phone, and I don't recommend testifying by phone. Um, you know, sometimes 
your phone has bad service or um, you might skip in or out, it's also sort of challenging to absorb the information from someone who's speaking on the phone. You can't see them, you can't read their lips. Uh, it's less interactive. There's just less of a human connection, even if we are viewing you through a screen. So the phone um, testimony is just not as professional as the other options. And I encourage you to, to use the other options if you are able to. Great. So with that, I'll pass it over to you, Sarah, if there's anything else. Thank you. Um, no, nothing to um, cover there. Next, we are going to look at a couple examples of written testimony, just briefly, so you can see what they look like. And then we're going to watch some videos on uh, actual testimony. So, and just as a brief review, um, which we talked about in more detail in a different training, but you can look up bills and testimony using OLIS. And, um, but first you have to choose the session. So 2022 regular session, and the bill we're gonna look at is 4101. You put that in and then there's a testimony tab. And then there I am um, in support of the bill, and then here I am further down um, in opposition to the bill um, once it was amended in the house. So you can see here um, as it pulls up opening document that it's on CLO letterhead. It's in memo form. And even though it's written, I kept that line in there introducing myself um, and explaining the acronym uh, so that if folks want to look us up later, and they can. So that's that example. And then also, I wanted to point out to you um, Rep. Scouton's testimony, which was really a one pager, which is a great example of how to include graphics and data in a very succinct way um, about the and really describing the need for this bill. So here you can see multiple graphics. And then a list of supporters here with all the logos and citations with links to more information. So I really like this example as well. Okay, so we are going to play testimony bingo next. Um, and I do want you all to um, pull up your cards, have some sort of marker or pen handy um, so that you can mark off your bingo cards as we go. And instead of shouting out bingo when you complete your five in a row, um, the first person to raise their hand virtually will be um, potentially the bingo winner if they um, if they got the right boxes checked. Um, so here we go with your bingo cards. Ready, set, go. I'd like to call on Sarah Lochner, the executive director of the Hawaii Coalition of Local Health Officials. Good afternoon, Chair Patterson and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Sarah Lochner here on behalf of the Oregon Coalition oh, of Local Health Sorry. Officials. Hey, I thought last time I saw you, you were in Oregon. <laughs> Sorry. I'm still in Oregon. That's okay. Um, CLO represents the local public health directors across the state. Um, and it's with great sadness that I am here to inform you today that the coalition voted to oppose the amended version of House Bill 4101. We were supportive of the underlying bill and was really hoping to help Rep. Scout and get it across the finish line, especially since this is her last session. However, um, the amendment adopted in the House, as you know, um, carves out an exemption for restaurants and bars, allowing them to keep that existing 10-foot requirement. We believe that the exemption makes the bill largely ineffective um, because where does most public smoking happen? Outside restaurants and bars. This is especially true now that so many people are working from home and not in an office environment where they take smoke breaks. We believe that there are equity concerns as well. Um, most back of the house restaurant employees are people of color. These would be the people taking out the trash and busing the tables and taking their 15 minute dinner break out back probably directly adjacent to the smoking shacks and covered patios where people are allowed to smoke. 
In addition, restaurants and bars tend to be clustered on busy streets, most of which are near lower income housing. So if you think about 82nd Avenue in Portland, for example, what type of housing butts up against the back of 82nd of all those restaurants and bars? Lower income housing. So the coalition believes that this double-sided policy will be very confusing for the general public as well and will drive complaints up drastically. Stan Glantz, a professor at the University of California, San Francisco, is a research in this area. And he says part of the value in smoking buffers and indoor, indoor clean act rules is about changing the cultural norm. I would argue that this is the perfect time to implement this change as people are aching to reconnect with their friends and return to no normal social interactions. This summer, people are going to be flocking to restaurants and bars. A new increased smoking buffer is not going to deter them. I think everyone will be more accepting of the new normal, including the increased smoking buffer, and will just be glad to be out and about. In this new world we are living in, keep in mind that we will also have quite a few folks dealing with post-COVID respiratory issues as well. They deserve to be able to enjoy eating outdoors without exacerbating their health issues due to secondhand smoke. So CLO opposes adding any additional exemptions, including those uh, proposed in the Dash 4 amendments. For these reasons, CLO encourages you to re-amend the bill back to its original form. This policy would be consistent with the science, as Rep. Scouten talked about, and with our surrounding states. Thank you so much for hearing my testimony. Okay. Oh, Jackson thinks he already has bingo, but we still have to watch another four minute example of testimony starting with Phil Bentley from the Oregon Healthcare Association. We'll hear the last minute of his and then I'll have a very short second testimony. The second part of the bill is intended to preserve the state and federal regulatory authority over the care and services and supports that are provided in long-term care settings by preempting local governments from adopting their own care standards. I believe uh, that we've achieved an acceptable balance between, between preserving the authority that local governments currently have over areas outside this field and preventing future actions that could lead to hundreds of care standards across the state. I want to state expressly that the intent of this bill is not to impede local public health authorities from implementing the initiatives uh, that they, that they <clears throat> pursue to protect public health. So this portion of the bill in section seven makes, uh, or of this amendment makes uh, also three changes. One, it clarifies and narrows the scope of the preemption in paragraph 2A to make it clear that it only applies to the care and services and supports that are provided to patients and residents of long-term care providers. And it is therefore not intended to preempt other policy areas or regulations that are generally applicable to all businesses. This is where we also place the important comma that is now appearing in the dash A18. Um, this amendment also clarifies that local public health is not preempted by this bill. And finally, the, bill, the amendment clarifies that lift assist ordinances that have been adopted by two jurisdictions, uh, the city of Portland and in uh, Clackamas are not preempted and that other local jurisdictions can adopt similar ordinances in the future if they so choose. And then finally, both provisions in this portion of the bill will sunset on January 2024. So there will be time for everyone to experience the implementation of the provisions in this bill, revisit any issues and potentially ask this body to revisit the questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Bentley? Thank you for being here. Thank you. And I just got a little note that Sarah, is Sarah Lochner in the room? She also wanted to speak. Good afternoon, Chair Holvey, members of the committee. Um, for the record, Sarah Lochner, 
Government Relations for Multnomah County. Um, here today to express neutrality on the Dash 18s and Dash 17s. Um, Multnomah County, along with Washington County, Lane County, and the Coalition of Local Public Health Officials, generally opposes preemptions on local governments, such as that on page. Dash 18s. Um, however, given that the proponent has put on the record that the legislative intent is to not prohibit local public health authorities from the enforcement of duties granted under ORS Chapter 431 or exemptions granted to local agencies under ORS Chapter 443, Multnomah County is now neutral on the Dash 17s and Dash 18s. So just for clarification, these are the public health statutes. Um, so with the important comma, uh, <laughs> I thank the speaker and her staff for entertaining our amendments and for the opportunity to testify in uh, our neutral stance and happy to answer any questions. Questions? So uh, the comma deals with your concerns about the preemption. That's what you're telling me. Um, I believe the comma was negotiated by Clackamas County, and I did not find where it was located before coming up here. <laughs> but we are supportive of the Clackamas comma. Okay. <laughs> That's one important comma. All right. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Clackamas comma. I don't remember that. Uh, That's going to come out in a floor nice. speech. And, yeah. All right. So back to our slides. We think we have a winner for testimony bingo. Jackson, what what um, blocks do you think you got on the first example? Um, I actually I went diagonal from left to right, so from gave brief test brief testimony for the free space and into explained RS. Although I was questioning it after I raised my hand, if you provided the ORS number since that was a a bill. Well, uh, I, I did provide it in the second testimony. Right. I figured you, you, you did the second demo. Disqualified. <laughs> hey, but the the gentleman I didn't get his name. He did reference the ORS numbers right after you. Yes. So um, I did give a real life example though, which. Um, you know, thinking about the 82nd Avenue example or um, the back of the house, um, back of the house staff at re in restaurants and bars. And um, I did cite specific, uh, the specific amendment, uh, dash 17s and dash 18s or whatever I said in that example. Um, so yes, I did, you do, um, win bingo unless somebody else wants to challenge him. <laughs> I don't see anybody else's hand up. Did they all give up because you raised your hand? <laughs> um, well, just we um, are running a little behind, so we'll hold questions to the end, but um, thank you everyone for participating in legislative bingo. Um, and we'll turn it over to Lizzie to talk about letters to the editor. Um, and go from there. Okay, thanks. So I'll make this quick um, and concise, uh, knowing that we are shooting for lunch, lunch hour, lunch and learn. Um, so briefly here today, I'm just going to talk about what letter to, man, letters to the editor are and why they are an important component in advocacy, um, how to write and submit LTEs, which is how we, the acronym for, for letter to the editor. Um, and then we'll discuss a little bit of high level CLO messaging and I've provided a template for you for writing an LTE, which I think is on the CLO website um, available for your use right now. So moving on to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, just to clear up any confusion about the difference between an LTE, letter to the editor, and an op-ed, also known as an opinion editorial, um, they are different, even though sometimes folks use the terms interchangeably. So LTEs are generally 200, 200 to 250 word articles. Um, they share a perspective related or unrelated to recent news. LTEs are more flexible, 
than op-eds and they can be about almost anything. In our case, we'll be using LTEs to frame why an investment is really important. Um, we might be asking folks to reach out to their legislators or to generally share something related to public health with the community. Um, Op-eds, on the other hand, are generally longer. They tend to be about 600 word articles. They're intended to capture a newsworthy moment um, and they must be approved ahead of time by the paper. So if there isn't a real drum of momentum um, for the paper to want to publish or just because of recent news, they could e you could do all the work to write an op-ed and then they could easily wave it off and you'd never see it again after you submitted it. So I suggest that we focus on LTEs, though op-eds can be useful tools as well. Um, if you have well-known speakers, um, if you have a good connection with the editor, um, if you have a topic that is perfectly timed for the moment. So those are things that we can talk about in the future as well, but um, for your own advocacy purposes, LTEs are great. So they're also LTEs are also valuable tools um, to share perspective or personal story that's not being captured by current news um, or through other earned media. And so um, they tend to be more personal and they should be used to compel others um, to consider a new view. Because they're so short, they can be strategically used um, in a few different ways. One of them is to submit the same LTE to multiple different publications at the same time. You could also um, have an LTE sort of like article writing party where several of you get together and you all submit LTEs of the same nature to your own local publications. Um, or you can do it over the course of a period of time to continue to remind folks about a certain issue. And so we can talk more about what those how to use those tools strategically with LTEs, but those are just some of the examples about um, how we can use them effectively. So we'll move on to the next slide here. Um, so because an LTE is so short, it needs to be really concise. This means fitting as much context into as few words as possible. And so your introduction should include your name, where you're from, and what your association is or why you're credible on the topic you're about to discuss all in probably the first sentence. Um, next, we use our values forward statements to indicate why an issue is, is important and or who stands to benefit. Um, we can do this before or after the messaging component, um, which generally together they complement each other. And so the messaging piece here um, is also effectively used as the ask or the call to action as we've talked about in the past. Um, for me, because it's election season, this is kind of top of mind. A great example is, I urge you to vote for X, Y, and Z, or I'm voting yes or no because. And so that is your call to action and also your values statement in one. Um, a great call to action includes an ask and the why, right? And so um, at the end of it all, we use our closing statement to. Uh, ideally be a one line, you know, one sentence line that says, um, this is what I just told you. This is what I'm asking you to do about it. Uh, go forth, right? So moving on to the next slide, those are the sort of basic components of an LTE. So where and how to submit, um, these are statewide publications. Again, um, I referenced earlier local publications that are really useful. Um, for folks like you to communicate with your audience or your community, you know, your words might go further in your own local paper than they do with the Oregonian or with the audience that reads the Statesman Journal. But um, these are also great publications to submit LTEs for, especially if we're talking about something that is a statewide issue. And so each of them have slightly different requirements. And it's really important to make sure you understand the requirements before you write your LTE, knowing whether um, they require your article to be 200 words or 250 words. The difference in 50 words can mean a lot um, with something so short. Also, sometimes they only accept LTEs on a certain date or they only publish them on a certain date. And so it's worth knowing what that schedule looks like in case you have strategic 
strategic, excuse me, timing in mind for um, your purposes. And so um, again, I wanna reiterate that your local paper is a great place to start with these LTEs. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a really meaningful opportunity to let your community know that you're out there that you're trying to communicate with them and that you're open, you know, you're opening your door for further communication. Okay, next, please. So on messaging, um, again, because these LTEs are so concise, we want to make sure that we include education first. Um, for so many, you know, we're reaching really broad audience with an LTE. And so as a result, we, we should not assume that they know what you're talking about or the details of what you're talking about. So it's it's really valuable to um, to use your introduction and your sort of credibility piece by providing that education as well. So you know what that looks like is um, I work for the public health authority. Public health does X, Y, and Z things to protect our community or to prevent the um, spread of disease outbreak. And so that's your sort of basic framing. It helps somebody understand where you're coming from or what you might be about to say, and also gives them a little bit of education about what you do. Next is values-based messaging, which are the messages that we've, um, we'll work to create for you. Um, but also these are ways to bridge gaps between your audience and yourself to share something in common. And then we bring it back to connecting to your own experience, talking about the local um, need or why something is beneficial to you or folks in your community. All right, next here. So we have examples and resources for you. Um, I'm gonna ask Sarah to click on this LTE toolkit list uh, link um, so that I can just briefly show you what this looks like. Um, and essentially it, it tells you what I just told you. So it's a description of what an LTE is, why it's useful, where you can submit to statewide publications. Um, it also gives you the basics of how you wanna think about the components of an LTE. It gives you some really high level messaging here. So unless the landscape for public health significantly shifts in the next, two years or so, 40 years, however long this document will live on the CLO website, it's always a valuable message to say, all Oregonians, regardless of where they live, deserve to be healthy. Public health plays a major role in protecting communities and preventing disease. That's your education. That's the values bridge. It's a great uh, message to lead with. We also have a secondary message, which which is related to the economy. So many folks are focused on that at this point. Um, healthy communities improve the economy. And we know that a lack of appropriate uh, public health funding negatively impacts Oregon's economy. So, um, oh, uh, sorry, those are different messages than what I've written and what I read, but you all can see the sheet and um, I suggest that you follow the economic messaging there. So it's concise because again, an LTE is so short, but we have this example here um, of how you would fill in essentially an LTE for a really basic purpose. Um, this ask or this closing statement includes, you know, sort of asking, just generally asking the legislature to support public health by investing in public health um, and to ask the community to join you, right? And so it's not um, not super specific, but it is one that encourages the community to care. Um, and so that's an effective ask if there isn't one that's burning right now. And finally, the last section on this toolkit is um, just your template for how you're going to put yours together. So you can reference the example above, and then you can um, plug in your own pieces, um, including the messaging um, in the toolkit and whatever is the most current um, ask that you have for, for your community or for the um, audience of the LTE. So with that, um, you know, my next steps for you, I recommend um, when it's time to write an LTE, if you're feeling excited about this now, get to drafting it. Know that it's gonna be really hard for your first draft to fit into the word count. 
But from there, once you once you have a draft, send it over to a friend or a communications professional um, and have them help you make your LTE more concise. There are plenty of ways where we can combine words or shorten sentences um, to, to actually meaningfully fit into 200 or 250 words. So I encourage you to work with somebody else on getting that final draft um, finished just to make sure that it's as um, meat, uh, like, you know, meaty as it can be and also um, really concise. And I'll just add too, it's great if you run it by a non-public health person as well, so they can tell you what parts are confusing or what um, really help you whittle down what information is extra to the point um, so that you can cut out the, the non-essentials. Yeah. And some of us are overly verbose. I tend to be that type of writer and speaker. And so it's easy to get carried away thinking those details are important when maybe they're just not critical to, to the current message or to the current um, goal that you're trying to have your reader take home. So good point, Sarah. Thank you. All right. We've got a couple minutes left for questions here. This is Jackson. Thank you for that presentation. It was very informative for me. I guess my only question would be, should I should I input my mailing address into the chat so you all can to email, or excuse me, stay up now for my prize for winning? Um, why don't uh, you just obviously. email me, Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> Since nobody contested your um, your win there, you got lucky. Any questions from anybody else about how to give testimony um, or how to write a letter to the editor? Oh, we have something in the chat here. <laughs> Laura thinks Jackson is asking the important questions here. Really? And I, sorry, Sarah, I'd interrupt you. I think um, one of the things that Sarah and I both meant to say, and I don't know if we did say this about both testimony and LTEs are that we will be there to help you along the way. You know, you're not alone in any of this work. So we want you to feel empowered to take these um, tasks on, but we're here to help you make sure that they are in tip top shape um, and that you feel good about what you're putting out into the world. So just wanted to also give you that um, little boost of confidence that we're not going to leave you, uh, you know, send you off the nest and never see you again. <laughs> In fact, if you give testimony at the legislature and you don't let me know, I will be upset about it. <laughs> um, so yes, I hope that you're coordinating with at least me on it and um, and Lizzie and her team are working on um, refining our messages for legislative sessions. So we'll have more of that to share at a later date as well. Any questions before we let you go? Hearing none, I think we can probably close out for today and um, tune in next week. We will have um, a special session on the election results. Um, we may not have all of the election results, but we'll have hopefully the majority of them. So um, next week, same time, same channel. Thanks everyone. Thank